Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin with the Northwestern Medicine's Bloom Cardiovascular Institute, and we're in Chicago, obviously, at the CAST AF meeting, which is an innovative meeting that Northwestern Medicine has started, really to bring together electrophysiologists and cardiac surgeons and others to learn about the newest therapies for people who have atrial fibrillation, which is a gigantic health problem. And I'm pleased to be joined by one of the co-directors who really sort of started this, this current meeting and who's Dr. Pat McCarthy, who's known to many of you. Pat's not only professor of surgery, he's also the executive director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and chief of cardiovascular surgery here at Northwestern. Pat, congratulations on the meeting. And thanks, Randy. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So uh, I was talking with Jim Cox earlier, and you certainly were one of the early adopters and learned from Jim about uh, surgical uh, ablation. Is it, is it widely utilized in cardiac surgery, say on the mitral valve, aortic valve, or during bypass, or not so? Well, it's getting better. So when we started doing much of this in the 1990s, if you looked at all operations, it would have been less than 1% of patients that had atrial fib would actually then have a surgical ablation, okay. a maze procedure okay. at the same time. Um, we just had a paper that came out uh, looking at the CMS database, and we're up to 25%. So, well, that's 25 times where we were before, I guess, but it's a class one indication now in our is guidelines. This, this, I'm sorry for interrupting. Is this for patients who are having mitral valve surgery or aortic valve, mitral valve, and cabbage? So it's actually for both. Okay. So if the, in our guidelines, if you're undergoing a mitral valve operation right. and you have atrial fib, it's class one indication to do it. And it's a level of evidence A because okay. of randomized trials. Sure. It's a level of evidence B if it is for an aortic valve or a coronary bypass operation. And Pat, these are people who've had documented AFib? It is. So they have to have you know, some documentation per halter, EKG, whatever it would be, pacemaker. So they, they're known AFib patients. So who, who is, who's the, it sounds bad, who's the ideal candidate? In other words, are these patients who have had, who are, let's say you're doing a mitral valve repair, which you do a fabulous job on, are these patients who've had one episode of AFib that's lasted for a period of time, or? So um, in some ways, everyone's an ideal okay. uh, candidate. That's so at Northwestern, for instance, 97% of the patients that have mitral valve surgery that have a history of atrial fib will have an ablation. And if you think of our other class one guidelines, like uh, left IMA to LED, right. We're at 99% compliance with that in the field, and if you're at only 98%, you're in the bottom 10%, like that's very poor. So we have a lot of ways to go with this one, but it's, it's a new recommendation, and it's a complex electrophysiologic problem, atrial fib, and you know there is some confusion within the community of surgeons on what's the best way and the most efficient way to do it. Is, is that why it hasn't been? I mean, the, the difference between what you said, the, the latest evidence shows 35% or something like that, yeah. and, and what you all are doing, why, why is there such a big gap? Obviously, you've been an early adopter and an expert in the thing. So it took a little while. Uh, we needed some randomized trials, but the trials were such that you could show a difference in heart rhythm, you know, 25% untreated and 75% if treated, and only 30 patients. And so, for instance, you could show a statistically significant change in rhythm, but not enough to show things that are really important, like uh, survival advantage and things. And actually, just in the past few years, uh, we had a paper from Northwestern, and now there's several others coming out showing for patients that had treated atrial fib, there's a survival advantage so that their you know, three, five, ten year survival is going to be better if you go ahead and treat the atrial fib. So we think the evidence is going to steadily move the field. But in addition, uh, what we've developed here is a kind of a newer, simpler way to do the right. most important portions of the operation. Um, but it's with just cryoablation and three lesions, for instance, on the left side, each one for two minutes. So it's six minutes of ablation. Doesn't add much to the surgery. So is it is it develop, is it with the same technology, the same de, the same catheter, or have you modified the catheters? So cryoablation has been around for a long right. time, but these are kind of the newer generation of the cryo probes. They're flexible and they're a little bit longer, so that you can make a longer lesion with them. And in addition, you can thaw them quickly, so that. 
uh, it used to be that they would get to minus 60, minus 100 degree, degrees centigrade, and you'd have to sit there a while Take to a while let again. those things to defrost, but now they defrost really fast. It's like the Christmas story. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. So, Because I've been in the operating room when, in the, when, when they're they waiting on that to defrost. Yeah, well, that's, that's fabulous that you, that you all have had that success and, and certainly have pioneered making it quicker. It seems to me then that if, if you're having mitral valve surgery now, okay, um, that this would be a standard of care. How do, you, how do you get that message out? So Jim and I are working on a publication with a new technique. There's about 250 patients now that I did in the last five years with mitral valve surgery plus this uh, specific technique of how to do the ablation and then uh, we'll make that more known over time. Uh, the results look great. Uh, the need for a pacemaker had been a concern with some of the prior versions mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. maze procedure. They'd been up to, in some studies, 15 to 20 percent. Uh, for just mitral valve surgery right. with ablation, right. it's 1 percent. Okay. And for the entire group of mitral valve and reoperations and with multiple valves, it was 4 percent. So that pacemaker concern has also gone away. So I think as people get to know uh, more about it, and then as we have more of these kind of meetings, right. so that people hear about it, then I think that um, it will become more uh, well known. Pat, uh, two, two, two other questions I just thought about. One is, obviously after you do a mitral valve repair, you would normally, without, say, with, uh, if, if you were doing it without a maze, you would put people on anticoagulation for a short period of time. After you've done the combined procedure, the concomitant procedure, do you leave patients on oral anticoagulants for a while, forever, we do. or what? So, you know, it's a little controversial in the field. Some places, if they don't have atrial fib, just put them on aspirin, although others, like me, I'll actually put them on a low dose of Coumadin, shoot for an INR of about 2 to 2.5, and do that for about 2 to 3 months. The reason being that the ring has to become endothelialized. Right, right. And um, Marie Serrano, others at Mayo, had told me that they studied it, and there were some embolic events early on if you don't use Coumadin. So they're on it for a while anyways. And then at 3 months and at 6 months, we get extended monitoring, like with mm -hmm. a Zio patch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or some other extended monitoring to show that they are out of atrial fib. If they're, off of, or if they're on amiodarone, we take them off to make sure that they stay out of atrial fib right. off amiodarone. But in about half of the patients, we're able to take them off of Coumadin. That's, that's fabulous. And so, you know, you really, uh, I think by speeding it up, the procedure itself, uh, keeping the same efficacy, that you probably get more of the colleagues jumping in on that, don't I you think? I think so. I'm thinking also that over time, we as a society, as we show that we can have it done more extensively, that um, we'll probably make it one of the star ratings, mm -hmm. one of the criteria mm -hmm. within SDS. And if you think of it again, like the mammary artery in the 70s, one very common, people use that. And then the Cleveland Clinic published in the 1980s, right. took a while, by the 90s, most people were doing it. Um, and so now, once they made it a star rating, then acceptance was very high. Well, I, I mean, I, I think not only have, have you continued to be a leader in this field, but certainly by educating your colleagues is really important. And that's, you know, again, congratulations for the meeting, because that's what I thank think you. you've done. It's been really good. So thanks for that. And thank you for joining us. I, you've learned something new, and I think there's more to come. So we want you to stay tuned, because there's lots of breaking new information coming out of this conference on how to treat atrial fibrillation.